Welcome, welcome, Max. Welcome to the podcast. Good to have you on. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So like I said, you know, I usually start with a little self-introduction. So if you don't mind uh, sharing a little bit about your story, your life, and, and what brought you to to start your business and, and what you're working on now. Yeah, I would say my business journey actually started right after high school. So uh, before going to college, I decided to take a gap year because I wanted to figure out what was out there in the world before choosing a major. Because these days, college is super duper expensive. You can't afford to just go into college not knowing what you want to do. So I decided to take a year off. And basically, I was volunteering full time doing this like a never. So I joined a organization called AmeriCorps. So we traveled to Florida to help with disaster relief, uh, California for the wildfires. But during this time, I learned that I wanted to help people. Um, so that's why I went into volunteering. But volunteering really taught me that I want to help people at scale. Because you can only help people one at a time when you volunteer, right? So like you, you help somebody, you know, in a food drive or something. But um, I really wanted to impact more people, more lives. And I figured out that business is a way to do that. So, you know, after the gap year, I went to college. Uh, so I just started working on a couple projects, not really hitting good win uh, until COVID hit. But when COVID hit, I just had so much free time. So I decided to delve into e-commerce full time. And the reason why I felt e-commerce was good for me is because e-commerce, you only need skills, right? You don't only need skills in marketing, uh, you know, running Facebook ads. You don't need lots of money. You don't need connections. And as a young student at the time, I had no money and, and no connections. So e-commerce was good for me for that. So I ended up going through maybe 20 different products. There are 20 different websites. I'm not really good at this e comm thing, at least in the very beginning, until I hit my big win in September of my sophomore year. So that is the STEM kids. We were launching gadgets, science gadgets for kids in order to spark curiosity in a young age. So we started scaling. I was doing like 3K for my bed, uh, for my dorm room, right? In college. Now that was crazy at the time. That was a profit too, until uh, we, we kept growing, growing, growing. And then we hit a 30K day uh, right before I decided selling the, uh, the business to an aggregator. Um, during, during, during this time, I learned, you know, so much about e-commerce either that I really wanted to stay in this sort of industry for, for a long time. So after I sold it, uh, now I'm working on a new brand, uh, in the skincare space. Great, great. And, and what did, what did you start on before getting into e-commerce? So these, some of these other ideas that you were saying, like sort of what, I mean, it's funny because you hear so many stories of different things that people get into. And obviously one of the big things that people like about e-commerce is the this, the, yeah, that you can sell it, right? It's a, it's like a, something you can build up, create value almost out of nothing. Right. And then, you know, you can sell it to most people, to an aggregator, like you're saying, but, um, but I just like hearing the stories of, of how people get to e-commerce, right? Cause I, I, something I've noticed is like, there's a bit of a bad rap that e-commerce gets, right? So then it, I'm always curious, like what made you get over that bad rap maybe, you know? Yeah. I mean. So there are multiple different products that try launching. Uh, the good thing about e-commerce is you can go very, very quick, right? Mm -hmm. They could set up a Shopify store within a couple of days, launch some ads, ads, whether or not it's an image ad, a video ad, that could take a couple of days. So you can really test out an idea that you have within a week, maybe two weeks. Uh, you really shouldn't take more than a month, but that's why I like e-commerce because you can check ideas very quickly. Uh, for, for some ideas that I had in the past, I, I tried launching a gaming brand. So we were selling laptops and well, without laptops, sorry, um, like keyboards, mouses, stuff like that. And that was not profitable. We had to shut it off within a month. I, I tried launching a UV light, uh, sanitizer brand that didn't work out, you know, just so many different brands. Uh, but, but eventually you're able to like switch very fast. And as somebody who didn't have a lot of money, but a lot of ideas in my head, I, I just kept testing every single idea I had in my head for the STEM kits. It actually, we, I spent maybe two days on the website, one day filming the ad, another day, like, uh, clipping the ad together. So then within a week, I was able to test out the idea and I knew it was profitable from the get-go. So then I just improved the product page and started scaling from there. And STEM Kids is the brand that you sold? Yes. So that's sure. the name of it? Okay. And yeah. what exactly did you sell? It was, now uh, the, the product was a miniature microscope. So a handheld mm -hmm. microscope. Uh, the problem with traditional microscopes is it's very bulky, you can't move it. Mm -hmm. And that means kids are less likely to use it. But for a portable microscope, you just point it anywhere and you can see like 
20 times, 30 times, a hundred times magnification. So it's very hands-on and, and the point of the brand was so that you can spark curiosity within children by showing them these cool things. Yeah, it's crazy. I feel like a lot of, and I, you know, it happens to me where, and, and I'm still in the product development stage for my brand, but people get really stuck on like the actual physical product, but it's crazy how almost anything can, you can sell, right? It's like, it's mostly just marketing and it's mostly just finding your niche group of people and then realizing that that niche group of people is actually massive. I feel, is that something that you, you, you agree with? Yeah. So once you feel like you can serve a person, definitely launch a product. The product doesn't even have to exist yet. So for the current product I'm launching, uh, a skin, skincare sunscreen, mm -hmm. uh, we just got the packaging created on Fiverr and then we launched it on the website. I had the image ads made on Canva and then we saw, okay, were people buying? If people bought, then we knew there was demand. We would just refund them. And then we start developing the product from there. But in that case, you can test out the idea. I think we tested out this idea for a thousand dollars because we wanted to be sure. And then now we know, okay, um, because like what business, right? There's always a level of uncertainty and that's what makes the beginning very hard because you never know if it's going to work. So testing out from the very beginning is very important. When you said you spent a thousand dollars, that's what you spent on ads or is that what you? Yep, ads. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Okay. Cause I think last time we spoke. You mentioned that what you like doing is, you know, setting up a website, selling a product, even though you don't have it in hand, and then just returning that to money back to people. Uh, yep. Is that what you're trying to do again? Yep. So that's what I did for the, the current brand. And um, so at this, so that was around a month ago for this brand. So we're just waiting for inventory now. So because I was able to test out the demand, I know for sure I can place like, you know, a 10K order, a 20K order that necessarily sweating too much about it. Of course, you know, things can happen, but you always want that level of certainty before you decide putting more money to it. And do you find that that tactic, I mean, I understand where you're coming from, but is that, do you find that that tactics, like people don't like the fact that you return the money to them? Right. Cause I mean, just, uh, you know, trying to be an independent opinion here. Like if I were to purchase something, I feel like, I don't know if I would repeat purchase if if they, if, you know, if you return the money to me, so, but of course yeah. you're, you know, it's, you're doing a small run. So then there's a million other people that could purchase the, the product. That, that, that's valid. So, um, some, some people do just like, Hey, if you're willing to wait a couple months, we'll give you a 50% off mm -hmm. discount. Just being open and communicative to the customers. Uh, if you don't want to do that, then it's always, you can just straight up refund that. It's only like five, 10 customers at least in the very beginning. So it's not going to impact your brand mm -hmm. at all. So you don't have to test why, like you don't have to test with a lot of people, just a couple people's fine. See what your ad metrics are. Basically what you're trying to figure out is can I acquire a customer for less than the cost of goods plus the cost of marketing? Mm -hmm. Let's say the cost of, let's say an ad cost is like $20 and the cost of goods are $10. Then you have that $30 like cost, right? Mm -hmm. So then let's say you're selling the product for 60 or $70. Then you have that buffer, right? So then you say, okay, if, I'm, if I can acquire these customers pretty cheaply, then let me go ahead and, and start buying more of the powder. So that's your margin. And then you're saying just 10 people is enough to, to know whether that, that, that would work or not. Yep. Yep. So especially if you run like rudimentary ads, right? So like the ads mm. that you run are not going to be the best. The page you run is not going to be the best. So if you're already getting sales from like a, a terrible page, a terrible ad that, you know, that once you make a good page, a good ad, mm -hmm. which you're going to learn over time that it's just going to, it's just going to blow up. And so as far as ads, do you, do you strictly stick to Google ads or do you, do you dabble in some sort of in, in, Instagram, Facebook mm -hmm. ad yep. uh, campaign? So I, I do, I do Facebook and Instagram ads. I don't really focus on Google ads for Facebook ads. What you can do is you can create different messaging, different targeting. So. You know, an ad can say, Hey, this is a sunscreen for clean beauty. Or you can say, Hey, this is sunscreen for people who want to all look younger and save, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or, Hey, this is a sunscreen for, uh, skin cancer, like, you know, but that's skin cancer. So you can test out different messaging, see what performs the best. Let's say clean beauty performs the best. And you can create a page around that. Right. And you can create a brand around that rather than simply guessing on what person perform the best, right? Mm -hmm. Except 
but you don't need to necessarily do that if you really know your target market and you really like want to cater to them. But in but this strategy, I feel like allows you to make a data driven decision rather than simply guessing. So you can sort of get data driven decision on what your audience is, is what you're saying. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Cause that, I mean, that's honestly the most difficult part that I'm, that I struggle with, right. Is like, I, I, although, you know, I'm probably part of my audience, but sometimes it's tough to realize, like, am I just unique? You know, am I just this one person that likes this one product, right? Am I just weird like that? Which, you know, I sort of am weird, but that's okay. <laughs> Yeah. But, uh, but you know, it's, so it's good to have like data driven. That's, I like that point. Mm. Yeah. Especially for, for sunscreen, for instance, there's so many different people that would target, right? Nature goers, uh, the other day, women who just wanted to keep their skin looking, you know, like young and stuff like that. So you really need that data driven decision to know that to move forward. Dude. And what, uh, what have you seen so far as far as your, your sunscreen? Yep. So and it what's your audience? Like- it seems like it's equal men and equal women that, that people like the, buy the sunscreen. It's really people who care about the, the clean ingredients that don't want to put toxic chemicals on their body. That's all that we've been able to figure out so far based on the, the ads. We plan on creating more ads to detail the messaging curve. Right? Okay, so this is just the beginning stages of this brand. For the STEM kids, we would test out, you know, do grandmothers like it, do mothers like it, do schools like it. And we figured out that all of them like it, but we really, but the parents angle really was the most profitable. So that means we started out with focusing on parents for the ads before branching out to these different angles and different markets. And when you started focusing on just the parents, were, was your ad campaign more effective and then therefore your profit margin technically more effective? You know, your, that, that Delta. Yep. Yep. Correct. And then we've actually branched out to other, other markets, but we really started with the parents. And how long was the, uh, the whole process? Like, was it a 12, like, you know, 12 months or was it a two, two years or since sophomore year? So you started sort of two years into, into college or you finished two years into college or. Yep. So I think I sold, trying to remember, I, I sold the brand March of, I think last year and then mm-hmm. I started this brand in 2020. So th- this brand, I think was around a year and a half to two years long, uh, from, from starting it from, from the very scratch to scaling it and eventually selling it. Mm. Yep. So, you so, just, I, I oh, so you say, just sold last year. Okay. Yep. So I would say it was a pretty quick process, but that's only because mm-hmm. we were using ads, right? So there, there are many different ways to scale. You can use influencers, you can use, mm-hmm. you know, organic social, uh, organic social media, SEO, mm-hmm. and there's paid media, which is just my focus, just because it is a little bit quicker and it does give a little bit consistent data. Hmm. What makes it quicker other than the fact that you have analytics to guide you? Yep. So there's the analytics part, just like you mentioned, but also, uh, you can just simply upload an ad and then you'll see results within three, three to five days or even quicker within like a day, right? So versus let's say you do an influencer strategy, you have to reach out to the influencers, you have to um, negotiate and then you have to send out the product. So maybe that could take two weeks, three weeks, maybe even four weeks. And then afterwards, you won't even know if the influencer will work until people start buying. So then, right. It can take a month versus an influencer strategy, uh, for an ad, it can take a week. So much, mm-hmm. much quicker. We do use influencers to augment and improve the ad strategy, right? So when an influencer makes a video, you can make an ad from that video. <laughs> Do you just send free product to the influencer? So yes, we did that. And we also do maybe like a hundred dollars for a video, the $20. So we just negotiate depending on, uh, the, the reach of the person, but we really focus on smaller time creators because they're, they're way cheaper. And also you can get co- good content from them that you can mm-hmm. use for ads. Free. Interesting. Yeah. Because one of the things I see with influencers is is their audience necessarily your audience and without the analytics that we're talking about, how do you know that? Right? So you have nothing guiding you. You're just assuming, which I'm a data driven person. So I don't like assuming things. Right. So, so I, I like your camp, your ad campaign idea here. Um, yeah, it, it is, it is a little bit harder to tell at times. I would, I would say I'm not the best 
influencer manager, mm -hmm. right? We, we just use influencers, not for the sales, but for the content. So I can't really speak to, okay, this is how you find influencers for sales. That's just mm -hmm. not my thing. Um, I'm really into focusing. So I, so for ads, that's where I focus on. Um, so, but for finding influencers for content, that is a very important skill to know just because you can get that, that ad that they create, put it into Facebook and, and go from there. Right. So when you say they, cre they create an ad for you, do they just, is it just a post of them using the product or, or what exactly is it? Yep. It could be just a simple one minute video of them making the mm. product. Maybe I have had people make hundred videos of them using the product. That, that was pretty crazy for only like a hundred dollars, just because mm. if, if they like the product, they want to, you can, you can even offer commission to it and then they'll, they'll talk about the product and then you can take that raw content that they give you and then mm -hmm. splice it up, make it into right, an ad, right. right? You can take that hook that they talk about. You can take them unboxing the video and then you can put it into an ad on Facebook. Yeah. Cause I, I was about to say the same thing, like even with podcasts, right? Like. I think clips do better than the podcast itself sometimes because, you know, it's just the nature of the, 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 the day and age that we live in, right? Like we just have shorter attention spans, um, or like we just live quicker lives, right? It's not always something negative, but, um, but yeah, you, they'd rather get a morsel of information than necessarily listen to an hour long podcast. Um, and then, you know, at least it guides them into it, right? Like, Hey, this guy hasn't been important to say it then I'll go listen to the full, the full form content. But, um, but yeah, like a 10 minute ad, I would not sit through. Right. I, mean, I get that it's not really an ad. It's probably like, I don't know, an unboxing or something like that is what you're, what you're referencing, but, but still, yeah. so you can definitely clip up almost anything nowadays. Um, yeah, yeah. I know for podcasts, sometimes they're like, there are people that can take like just one habit, picking it, maybe like short podcast and then mm. make it into a hundred different types of content, right? You can make. Maybe out of that original video, you can make 15 reels and then you can start posting on Twitter and then you can post mm -hmm. on, you know, Instagram and TikTok. So there's really lots of ways you can repurpose that just one piece of content. Yeah. I mean, and honestly, the, the more, you know, I get into this podcasting world, like the more I realize like everything is content, like you can really just make content out of like absolutely anything. Um, you just have to be willing to do it. And I mean. That's up to you, right? Like, I don't know. I'm not the type of person that wants to be filming every minute of their lives, but, uh, some, some people do, right. And you know, that's part of them. If they're willing to do it, then they can create a brand around it and they can, you know, uh, create value. Um, because yeah, everybody, everybody does have some intrinsic value that they can bring to the world. I really do believe that. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and that sort of leads me into my next question, like what you know, what was the mindset that you had when you first started? Because I mean, man, you're, you were young, like you were what, 19 or something like that. When you first got yep. into all of this stuff, you're still in college, you know, like when I was 19 and in college, I was like partying, man, you know <laughs> okay. what I mean? Like I, I was just trying to, trying to live my best life back then. You know what I mean? I wasn't thinking like, oh, I want to, you know, start a podcast or, or start a business or, I mean, I knew eventually I would, but like, you know, mm -hmm. and everybody has their own path in life, but, um. But yeah, like what, what was going through your head after you got back from your, from your gap year? So I would say two things like number one, after the gap year, I realized that school wasn't the best way for me to achieve my goals. So I knew from the get go that I wanted to start a business and COVID just gave me the opportunity to do that because I had additional time. Right. Uh, the second thing is and in terms of mindset for business, I think this could be more applicable to people where I thought about it as rolling the dice, right? So. Every single time you try to launch a, a brand, at least for e-commerce, that's one roll of the dice. And the, the good thing about it is that every single time you roll it, you, you get better odds and oh, you only have to hit, you know, you only have to hit it once for you to, um, you know, just succeed and retire basically. Right. So mm. in, in my eyes, I just had to keep, keep launching new brands. Uh, I knew the odds would eventually turn to my favor and then uh, I just had to hit it big once. So that's why I kept going, even though I, you know, failed with 20 different products, 20 different websites, that sort of thing with many different, um, failures along the way, I just knew that it was getting better and better over time, sure. but it, it definitely was difficult. Like, you know, like getting banned on Facebook, it was definitely like, I think, like I would think, oh, am I really going down the right path? Mm -hmm. Is this really for me? 
But then I would always just reference to the fact that this is just how it's supposed to be in business, right? It's all about um, rolling the dice. I would say that you have to be quick, right? Because let's say you roll the dice once and then it takes you one year and then you have to roll the dice again. And at that point, you'll be, you know, much, much older and you won't have that enough time to, mm-hmm. to I guess, right? Just only a limited amount of time so you can roll the dice depending on how quick you are is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. And so what made you, I guess, where's that tipping point, right? Because like, I guess you could take one path of like, okay, I'm just going to, if you have sort of a, just a long time horizon and say, hey, you know, this is going to take me two years and you can just really just focus and, and, and trust that, that that that's how long the process will take. And then, you know, pick your product and really put effort into it, dial in your audience, all that stuff versus I guess the, the path that you took, which is more so like, okay, let me just churn through as many, uh, you know, through a good amount of products and then see which one sticks and then roll on forward with that one. So I guess it's just a different yeah. approach, but, but yeah. Um, so I like the second approach in the beginning. So it, of course it depends on your path in business and what stage you are in business. So, um, for the first path where you stick to one particular business plan for two years, that does work up for a lot of times, but only if you have the previous knowledge to know that it's going to work, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like if you're just like stumbling and trying to figure out, okay, does this work? Does that work? Does this sort of strategy work for this particular product? I feel like that's not the way to do it because you don't have the perspective of multiple failures and a success to guide you forward. But for the second path where you're stumbling very quickly and you're learning quickly, then you'll, you'll hit a success and you'll know, okay, this is what I need to do in order to hit success. Let me try replicating it in the next business. And for the next business, you can know for a fact if it's going to succeed or fail based on the metrics that come earlier. So to give an example, um, for my current product, the, the sunscreen, I see the metrics from the very beginning. I know it's going to take a long time because it's going to take four months to manufacture. Um, it's going to take months to try to get the content because I need to wait for manufacturing. But I saw the content, uh, I saw the metrics initially, so I know that I can stick to it for a lot of time. Versus let's say I was just beginning, I didn't have the metrics to back it up, then I wouldn't know if I'm going to succeed or not. So I really think it just depends on your prior knowledge of, you know, business, let's say e- e-commerce in particular, as to whether or not you should stick to to it or in the long term. So generally to, to somebody that's doing this for the first time, you'd recommend the, the second alternative, the that going through several products. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just, right. yeah. Yeah. Just so that you learn quicker, that you get that perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I see. And when you were going through these different products, did you actually get them manufactured or are you just testing them all on? Yeah. So we were drop shipping it initially. Right? So mm-hmm. that's within the first maybe 50 to 100 customers. And then afterwards we transitioned into buying it in bulk from China. Uh, Hong Kong in particular. So it was pretty quick in terms of transitioning to a bulk order. But again, we were testing uh, from the very beginning. So we wanted to keep it short and, and sweet. So that's probably good job shipping. And I'm assuming but, these products were not, um, like you didn't need to do much product development for these products, right? They were just things that you can s- s- almost get just manufactured in, in China, sort of Alibaba route type of thing. Yep. So we were lucky that the product already existed in the market. It was just being marketed incorrectly. So mm-hmm. the microscope was being marketed towards people who were um, analyzing mm-hmm. their weed, weed plants because you can, you know, pull up like leaves on weed and then like check mm-hmm. it out the microscope. <laughs> but okay. then I, I saw that it would be very good for kids instead. So that's why there was an already existing product out there. I just marketed it differently. Um, but for, for this product, is that really, for, for the sunscreen, is that really a like existing product out there. There is some Etsy products, but there's nothing that you can find in China. In fact, when we reach out to the suppliers in China, pretty much every single person said no to us, except for two, and we reached out to hundreds because mm-hmm. they would not use tallow, which is the ingredient that we're using. So th- this product is really new in the market, but still, I was still following the strategy of testing it um, pretty cheaply, right? We didn't have the product, but we had the packaging available so we could see if people wanted it. Yeah, it's funny. It's, you know, if you would have talked to me five years ago, well, I mean, I've sort of been in the health, on a health trip for a long time. So I knew what tallow was, but 
I don't know, just five years ago, probably nobody knew what tallow was. And now every, you know, now you get ads and I, you know, you see all these tallow products and, and, um, I actually just had another, uh, friend on the podcast, a couple of podcasts ago, that's making a tallow based sort of, um, balm sort of, yeah, like face balm and general balm. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely a, a, a tallow boom right now. Uh, yeah, but, but yeah, speak a little bit about your, about your, about your sunscreen, I'm, I mean, I don't know. I'm assuming it's not proprietary because it's if it's uh, very natural, it's usually like four ingredients. So um, yeah, yeah, we're yeah. yeah so we're, this is this is the product we fairly yeah. have. Um, so it's called Thrive. Yeah. Uh, but awesome. we're gonna change the name name to Sky and Soul soon. So can even the logo, like in, it's, can you put uh, it in the center there? Yeah, there you yeah. go. Awesome. So, so even, yeah. even the logo I designed are not finalized, but we're, you know, you're still able to test out the idea of your cage. And oh. in it, it's just supposed to be five ingredients, uh-huh. five, five to seven ingredients. We're still trying to figure out the formula yeah. out, but it, it's actually really good. So, uh, the, the main gist of it is that it's supposed to be so safe that you could theoretically eat it. So you no know, on ads and stuff like mm-hmm. that, we just like, we just lick it yeah. and then, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, nice. <laughs> like, like eat it. So, uh, it's really supposed to be a safe to a uh, toxic industry. So for sunscreen, um, they use very toxic chemicals. It's an endocrine disruptor. It can lower your testosterone. It can make periods worse just because of how bad the chemicals are. In terms of uh, what's found in the blood, it's nine times the FDA limit. So that's, that's pretty bad because it's very absorbable. For our product, it's very safe. So that's what we're going for in terms of the angle to the, to the audience. What products are nine times the, the FDA limit? Any product that ha- that's a chemical based sunscreen. So mm. CeraVe, very, very, mm. very popular right. um, product that's used by women out there. If you look at the back, it has like homosylate, it has oct- octosate. It's like, you know, very like ingredients mm. that are hard to put out, but are, are toxic towards us. Right. Because the main ingredient in just regular sunblocks, I think, is. What is it, benzoate or something like that? Like it's the main, like, like actual, avobenzo. Like, avobenzone, like, yeah. And yeah. there's like benzene has, has been found in some mm-hmm. of them. So there's two types of sunscreen. There are mineral sunscreens and chemical sunscreens. The chemical sunscreens are the toxic ones. The mineral sunscreens have the problem of the white cast. So like, you know, mm-hmm. it, you know how when you put on sunscreen, it sometimes turns you see like, like a ghost almost. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, we're, we're fixing that problem with, with our sunscreen. Although sometimes it's an aesthetic, you know, like some people who want the two lines or something, you know. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like, like lifeguard you know. sort of thing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But no, yeah, but most people don't want to look like Mark Zuckerberg, you know. What I mean, like all just like, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was that in uh, Costa Rica? Right, you know, surfing. I yeah, think. exactly. That's awesome. yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's sort of what's that other picture of like Elon Musk that that he um he gets out onto somebody's yacht or something and just like peer the white. But that's just because he works like so much, but, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's funny, man. But that's cool. So you, you, what's the main ingredient, uh, the, the main protective ingredient in your, in your sunblock? Yep. So it's going to be zinc oxide. So there's only two pretty much, uh, FDA approved chemicals for first mm-hmm. sunscreen. There is uh, zinc oxide and then there's titanium dioxide. So we use zinc oxide, which is perceived as safer for people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we, we are trying to aim for our SPF 50 for, for our product. So, Super. um, if some other ingredients in the sunscreen include like tallow, coconut oil, olive oil, um, shea butter. So mm-hmm. ingredients that are really, really common within the, the industry. Yeah. They're just like generally just good for your skin. And then you just add the zinc oxide and it becomes sunblock. And, mm-hmm. and that's, that's nice. SPF 50. I feel like, I don't know if you, if you agree, but sort of over the years, first of all, people are finally realizing, I think that some block, you know, it has a very healthy stuff, but also like you don't need SPF a hundred, right? Like yeah, I feel, and I mean, even me, like I do some occasionally use sort of a zinc oxide based, uh, sunblock. I, I try to get as much vitamin D as I can, but you know, you, if you spend five hours in the sun, that's probably maybe not a good idea that it's, you, know, you probably throw a little, a little sunblock on, you don't want to peel, you know, yeah. your skin. And at that point it's bad, but yeah, but, for, for me, you know, like currently I only put it on my face, mm-hmm. uh, for every, every other part of my body, I don't necessarily use sunblock just because mm-hmm. I'm already tan. 
So I don't burn as in sleep. And also I want the, the vitamin D from sun. So again, for sunscreen, even though I am selling it, I want people to use as much sunscreen <laughs> as possible. It's not necessarily something you have to, uh, if you're already, if you already have sun calluses, if that makes sense. So if you're already, um, outdoors a lot and, but, but for people who, you know, let's say they're indoors most of the time and then they go outside to vacation, then sunscreen is definitely necessary because you haven't built up the sun tolerance. And then you're going to yeah. get burned. And if you get sunburned, then that increases your, your chance of skin cancer. Yeah, that's a big thing. I mean, people like, you know, I've had conversations with people where I'm just like, oh yeah, like I don't really wear sunscreen and yeah, except for maybe like, like, like instead of putting it on my face, I put it in the back of my neck or something. I just get like just living in Texas, you know, like you just get red completely. But, um. But, uh, but yeah, I mostly just almost never use sunblock and people are like, oh, well, like, how do you not use sunblock or something? And, uh, it's just like, well, I'm in the sun every day. So then, you know, you build up that tolerance over time as opposed to somebody that's like, I don't know, like a software engineer that never goes out of his room and like, you know, he suddenly gets into the sun for two hours and then is, you know, losing all his skin. I'm like, well, that's why, right? But, if but yeah, it's. You yeah. can't just jump in in the sun. So. Yeah, it, exactly. And I, I would say that sunscreen does also prevent like grickle formation. So if you do want to, you know, look younger for, for longer and then sunscreen does help. So that's why I didn't put it on my face. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's a, there's a time and a place for everything, but, um, but that's good. That's good. So how long, how long have you started this, uh, this shallow based sunscreen? How long you've been working on it rather? Yeah. So it's been around a month and a half. So uh, I tested out the idea early, like, like late June, early July, uh, we, we found that it was profitable and then we've been reaching out to manufacturers. So that has been our rate limited step. Our bottleneck has mm -hmm. been trying to acquire the, the product from manufacturers because until then we're, we're kind of sitting on our hands, not able to do much because you can't, like it is illegal to sell sunscreen without the testing, the SPF testing. So you want to make sure that the sunscreen does work and it does actually block, you know, 98%, 99% of UVA and UVB rays because it is a, considered a drug, right? Because it does protect people from the sun. Oh, wow. So you get that testing done here in the States? Uh, no, we're going to do it in the States. Yeah. Rather, I'm not in the States. Long <laughs> I'm, I'm in Panama, but you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're, doing, we're doing it in China. So they, they're able to do the SPF testing for cheaper just because it was a cheaper country there. Here in the States, I don't think it would have been possible for us to launch it here because Where they you require you were testing. Sorry. Where did you say you were testing? China. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. So in the States, they were requiring 10,000 MOQ. So we would have to buy almost, we would have to buy almost $50,000 worth of sunscreen from the very beginning, plus testing, which could take another month. So then we would wait four to five months plus be $50,000 in the hole. So that would not have been worth it. So now we get back to China. The testing? $50,000, $50,000, including testing and product. Mm, okay. Yeah. So not, not necessarily something we want to do from the, from the get go. Right. So right. instead we're able to buy the product plus do the testing for like 10 K in China. Mm. So mm. much more reasonable. Yeah. So how's, how is that, how is the fact that you've already you know, started and sold brand affected how you started this one in terms of how much money you have or are willing to put into this brand, right? Because like you were saying before, like you really don't need to put, like if you have a thousand dollars, you can start a brand, right? So, so yeah. How has that changed now? Yeah. So I definitely made the mistake that lots of people who've exited in the past do where they um, think that everything they touch turns into gold and that they launch a brand. Or maybe they start a software company and then they burn through hundreds of thousands of dollars. So right after I, I sold my brand, I started another brand called Dottie. So we were trying to solve the problem of period pains for women using like an electrical machine that basically um, sends like small electrical signals to stop the nerves from sending pain up to the brain. So we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars testing on ads and stuff like that and flopped. Like we didn't get much sales at all. So basically I disregarded everything I've learned from the STEM kids and just went all in. I did, I didn't test out the product beforehand using ads. I bought the product in bulk before testing, right? That's what I did. 
And then um, I didn't really focus much about on ads. And instead I focused on, well, I didn't even focus at all. I just did like ads, influencers, organic blogs, social media. So I was doing everything at once instead of focusing on just one thing. So that for this brand, I learned a lesson where I should just focus on one avenue to acquire customers, which are ads for people. It could be influencers or whatever. And then I tested out the product idea beforehand, right? Using, using ads, which, you know, people can test out again with influencers. So um, that's why I really, really tapped the strategy because I've done both, right? I, I've, I've launched with bulk orders and failed. Um, and the thing is, I also lost the time because I spent a year on the bread when instead I could have spent maybe, I could have probably tested through 10 or 15 different ideas within that year. Mm -hmm. So I lost the time and the money. But you learned your lesson, right? So yeah, <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, but it was a very expensive lesson, you guys. So I don't, don't want to do that again. Yeah, yeah. Was it just you on that one, or did you have a business partner? Or yeah, so so I also made the mistake of hiring a lot of people from the very beginning. So we had thirteen mm -hmm. people. So that's that also led to the the inflated like losses that I mentioned right. earlier. So uh, all these people were doing many different things, like advertisements, like social media, blogs. We had three graphic designers, we had a COO. So that's why it was very inflated. So I'm curious about your opinion on hiring people, right? Because I guess I'm sort of of the opinion of like, okay, you know, spread your time wisely, right? Like, or, or leverage, leverage other people's time rather than your time, right? So, but there's a happy medium there because let's say you haven't even cash flowed yet. And so then when do you, when do you get to that point of, but you know, you, you have to have some sort of upfront investment and depending, you have to, you know, just like reflect and see where your time is best spent and maybe putting in some money to hire somebody to do something that, especially if you like hate doing it, it's like, Hey man, just like, you know, <laughs> just like, uh, get it done by somebody else. Right. Somebody that's, that's their favorite thing to do. Right. So, yeah, I mean, so, so for me personally. I focus on the sales side of like starting a company. So like, I, I think a CEO, the CEO for a beginning company should always focus on sales, bringing in customers. So that way you can at least figure out how you can acquire customers. So you can eventually hire that out. So you can hire a copywriter, which, which copywriters basically write, um, words that sell and scripts for advertisements, but you can't really hire that out until you know how to do it yourself. So it's important for the CEO to know that sales process. A CEO that let's say focuses on product is good, but then how about if you don't know how to sell it? So how do you find somebody to sell it? Well, you can find an agency, but you don't know if that agency is going to be good. So then you can assemble and fall, go through many, go through tens of hundreds of agencies and probably still fail just because you don't know how to do it. So I think mm. sales from the very beginning is good or a sales focused co-founder. So if you got to do, if, so if you don't like sales, I think you have to give up equity to somebody who does know how to do it and that you trust wholeheartedly and completely to do it. Um, in terms of operations, I think operations for e-commerce is pretty simple. Uh, you just need to find a manufacturer and then you'll handle a lot of the logistics. You find a third party logistics center, they do the shipping. So if you think about it, operations, while still a very important part is easier to learn. So then if you have operations done, you just really need that sales component of it. Um, go ahead. So would you say don't hire somebody else to do it unless you know how to do it first and then get somebody to, that way, you know what you're looking at. That way, you know, the process, see if they're, I mean, I don't know, maybe see if they're wasting time or you not do yep. their job well. And so, so, so I, I would say that is the case for beginner entrepreneurs, especially mm -hmm. when I was just starting out. I do know people who are just able to hire out for the get-go and they succeed and they go grow very, very fast because they're able to identify the right people. But that requires you to know the skill of identifying the right people, which I think occurs after you've done many different failures in hiring. Mm -hmm. And you only reach that point once you have a sustainable business that cash flows and you get that cash flow probably because you know how to sell from the very beginning, right? So I, I know that. That that is the whole like logic train there, but mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say is learn how to sell from the beginning and then you can hire people that know how to do it for you. Mm. Interesting.
Yeah, that's good. The tough part is finding, you know, if you were wanting to find a co-founder, it's like finding a co-founder isn't the easiest thing in the world. Um, I don't know if you've had a different experience. Have you always started these brands alone or have you had co-founders in, in the past before? Yeah, I've had like one or two co-founders that didn't really end up working out mm. just because I do find that me personally, I do enjoy working alone mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of the leadership position. But eventually I did hire a COO, gave him equity for that. But I do want to be able to drive the vision of the company because I do think you need to move fast from the very beginning. Say that again. You gave him equity for what? I, I gave the COO equity for, for mm. in, in, in the business. So he handles a lot of the hiring. He handles a lot of the, the current um, business? logistics. Yeah. For the current business. And, and also, uh, we have him in the Philippines, right? So mm. he's getting paid like a low salary considered here, but high salary in the Philippines. And since he gets equity, which is very uncommon in the Philippines, he's, he's yeah. happy for that. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So eventually if you do sell. Then he'll be able to reap some of those benefits. So that's yeah. great. That's good. That's good. Sure. That's awesome, man. So um, seems like you're turning over quick for this one, though. Uh, things are developing. I don't know. You're saying a month, a month in, got manufacturing going. Should have moved, moving, not moving along. Um, so yeah. So so it is a little bit scary because for sunscreen in particular, we don't know the demand for winter. Right. So I was able to test the demand for summer. But because of the nature of time, I'm not able to test the demand for winter. So we could sell only in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you need other, just, you need other like permits, regulations, whatever. If I were to say sell in Australia, because sunscreen is considered a drug. Um, so it could be iffy in the winter. So we'll see. <laughs> I mean, maybe, I don't know. I still, I mean, I know people that apply sunscreen every day, regardless, right? They're just like, oh, they're terrified of cancer and they just, you know, not, not that you should go off of somebody's fear, but like, you know, there, I suppose there will be people that'll, that'll want to apply sunscreen even in the winter because UV can, some amount of UV can go through the, not much, but can go through clouds and such. So, so yeah, yeah. but so yeah, yeah but you're that, waiting uh, on the analytics for that to see yeah, how things go. The, the analytics and also the target market that we had in the summer, which performs very well, may not work well in the winter so that we need to find the target market that will, performs well in the summer and winter which we can only do once we hit winter time. So mm -hmm. we, can, we can't test until then. To get By to then, it. I would have already paid for the inventory, paid for all the shipping, and it would be sitting in the warehouse. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it, it is a little bit scary on that. Mm -hmm. and, and you said you did figure everything out and get, were able to manufacture everything in China, you said? Um, so we have two manufacturers right now that we're looking at mm -hmm. that have sent samples over. Uh, there is... Of course, anything, anything can fall through. So, right. but at least we have one backup. Uh, we're really hoping that it goes through though. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's just a matter of time at this point. Right. I mean, eventually somebody will come through, right? I guess you said you had 50 or so people and only two came out, but just have, a, have to have a little faith I've found. But um, yeah, that's good. That's awesome. That's awesome. But uh, yeah, so... I guess my next question is like, where do you see yourself going? Like, are you just going to be, or like, what do you, what do you want from the future? Like, do you just see yourself as, as a serial entrepreneur going from one product to the next or, or you said you'd like to sort of dabbled in something that isn't necessarily a physical product. Well, I guess the, the, the period pains product was a little mm -hmm. bit like more tech oriented. Do you see yourself maybe getting more complicated products that need more engineering. Cause I, I think when we first met, we were both talking, they were both engineers, right? And like, so that's our background. And so, yeah, I'm curious, like, do you want to build out a, maybe a tech company? And I have my qualms with all that stuff, but, um, but I, I'm just curious to know yeah. your, your opinion, you know? Yeah. You know? I would be interested to hear what you have to say about tech companies, but in terms of, um, you know, the answer to your question, after selling my company, I did feel a little bit like empty, if that makes sense, just because you put all this time and effort into, into your baby and then your baby's gone. And then just like how parents, when their kids leave the nest, you don't really know what to do. So then I did feel, I wouldn't say like depressed, but like, it was like, it was like a hard time for me. So I think lots of founders go through this where once they sell, they, they go through this like depression phase when you don't know what to work on. 
stuff like that. So for this sort of product, I do feel like we're helping a lot of people. So I don't want to sell it for a long time. Preferably, you know, like within the next five, 10 years, I want to really be working on this, see where I can take it sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, after that, I'm not sure. Maybe, I, of course, I want to reach higher higher levels of business, see what sort of product I want to go to next. I am pretty passionate about, you know, aging. Maybe we can figure out a way to you know, slow it down or whatever. So I might work into that just because I'm really into science, chemistry. But for now, I just want to focus on this sort of bread, see where I can take it. I don't want to sell it because I already experienced that. And I know that it's not really for me. Really? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, you know, I talk to a lot of people that are doing their first brand and, and obviously the, the first thing that they want to do as soon as they can would be to sell it. Right. Yeah. So, cause the, I mean, it gives you the leeway to then do the, do work that you want to do or like passion projects and all that type of stuff. But yeah, um, yeah, I guess that's sort of what you're saying. Although right now this is your baby, but you're taking a different viewpoint, right? With this, like you're not trying to sell it. So then how is, how is your approach in business different now that you're thinking like 10 years like that, that was surprising. I mean, honestly, to hear that from you. Yeah. I mean, uh, to, to address something that you said earlier, well, like, so when I sold the, when I started the business, it came from all like a place of scarcity, right? I just wanted to make money so that I could, you know, be free. And then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like they, they create up because people. Mm -hmm. In, in business, usually go into it because they want that financial freedom. But when you start your first business, is that usually the thing that you're most passionate about and that you feel like you're placed on this earth to do? Once you sell that business, then you have the money and resources in order to go on the next thing. Where you have the perspective on what could work and what could not work. And you also have the money to work on a project that you feel is valuable. So I think there is progression. I, I feel like for the first business that people start, it's not always going to be the most aligned with your values or aligned with what you want to do with the world, but maybe the second or third might. In terms of the time frame for, for the company uh, that I'm currently starting, it aligns with my values and aligns with what I want, I want to do with the world, which is, you know, help people and their health. Because uh, when I was starting the STEM kids, I did neglect my health a lot. And I figured out that you can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have health, it does not matter at all. So that's why I want to help people in that regard. Um, and I feel like since it aligns with my values and, and also aligns with my skills, I think I can work on this brand for 10 plus years. And I also want to see where I can take it because for every level of business, like seven figures, eight figures, nine figures, you have to evolve as a person. And I want to see what I'm going to be like as I hit those numbers, if I hit it, which I, I hope I do. But, you know, um, I think having that time frame allows me to, to have the best chance of hitting that goal. Mm. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, obviously I haven't gotten there, but, um, you hear from people that have, and it, they just say that money just amplifies who you are, right? Like it, it just, like, if you're a bad person, it's just gonna make you a worse person, right? <laughs> you know, but if you're a good person, then you can really like do good for the world, you know, like it's, uh, like cap, like being sort of a capitalistic minded, right? It doesn't always have to be. A negative thing and i feel like that it's a it's a good mission it's a it's a worthy mission to to try and you know make positive change and doing it like through business is i think the best way to do it right because that's what where you genuinely can make change in the world because like like oh well like i guess you you had that exact experience right like when you first got started and in, in um you know your gap year right like you, you can't make lasting large change unless you have some, I, I, I mean, the word that comes to mind is power, right? Which maybe a little bit of a negative connotation to it, but, but it, I feel like it doesn't have to be right. And, and, and everybody, and it's funny because I feel like powerlessness is like something that really pushes people to become entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. right? And wanting to find that power, but then you, you sort of realize eventually that that power comes from within, like you're, you're looking for it in an, you know, outside in the world, but really it's just something you can wake up one day and, and decide that you're making that decision for yourself. So, so yeah. yeah. So like we, when you were talking earlier about how money amplifies mm -hmm. who you are as a person, 
that does remind me of something that Kobe Bryant said where like beating people in the NBA is so, so easy. That's what he said. Just because as soon as these people go to the NBA, they have the money and then they don't, they lose that drive. If that makes sense. They we're always about that money. And once they have it, they, the drive is lost. So then there's only a very select few people in the NBA who actually have the passion for basketball, for, for the sport. I think the same way is in business. And I did realize this within myself where once I got the money, I did lose a pretty substantial amount of drive. Mm. So that was like, okay, I realized that within myself, but I also realized that I need to be working on something I am passionate about. So, so I eventually found that the brand that does work for me and aligns with my goals. But I think people will end up, I think lots of people within their entrepreneurial journey, once they do hit money, they'll have to make a choice whether or not they want to keep working on something, going through that stress, but they have that end goal in mind, or if they just want the money, which is totally fine and enjoy that money over time. Yeah. Cause uh, it's funny. I, I met a guy that had so, just sold his company. I don't know. And I, and I asked him, it's like, oh, so what's next? And he was just like, nothing, man. Like, I'm just going to chill and enjoy. Cause that was stressful as hell. Which, yeah. you know, that's totally I respectable. Think, I think within the next that's month, he's going to, he's going to be bored of it. I, I didn't, I didn't know him personally, but like, if he is like the typical entrepreneur type, I think he's going to mm -hmm. want to start something new very soon. Yeah. I mean, it, it's only natural. What are you just going to like, if you're 20 something, you sold the company, what are you just going to sit around for the next year? Like, you know what I mean? It's like, and, and also you, you see people that like retire like really retire early, like they just start deteriorating. I feel near. like if they, if you don't have like some sort of mission in life, even if it's, you know, let's say you make a billion dollars and, and, um, and you know, you're done, like, oh, start a, start a nonprofit or something and go, you keep, you keep yourself busy because of not, I don't know. I feel like it, uh, it, it's, it's not, it's not a way to live, right? Like you need some sort yeah. of mission every day when you wake up. So yeah, I do. I do think you, us as humans, we're always wired to be working on something. It's just the way it is. I feel like fighting it is not really the way forward. It's just something that you have to accept. Fighting what exactly? Fighting like, 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 like you know, like people who retire early, they're fighting the urge to keep working if that makes sense, just because they feel like work is stressful, but work gives a lot of people purpose. I'm not saying it's like everybody, of course, there are some people who are able to, you know, just retire and, and enjoy life. But I think a large majority of people do find meaning in meaningful work. And I feel like if you, if you really consider retirement, like if you, if you're in your head, you're like, okay, uh, I'm going to work. And then at 60 ish, I'm going to retire. I feel like you're not doing what you're meant to be doing, right? Because yeah. you wouldn't be thinking like, oh yeah, at 60, I want to stop doing what I'm doing, right? You, you, like you'd be thinking, okay, um, I want to just continue as long as I can, because I love this stuff or, you know what I mean? So yeah, maybe that's a good just, heuristic, like, or a mental model where mm. can, can I see myself working on this until I'm dead <laughs> or like, you know, 90 <laughs> or something, or until I, I physically am able to, if the right. answer is yes, then continue. If the answer is no, then you have to uh, pivot or transition. Yeah. But it's, I don't know, it's, it's a pretty daunting heuristic, but I mean, I like it, but it's, all right. And sometimes you just got to go where fear leaves you, right? It's like, okay, I'm terrified of this, but I really want to do it. So let me go do that. Right. And you just got to push through it. So yeah, right? yeah I would say lots of people, um, it's like, you know, there's, there's like a risk tolerant spectrum. And of mm -hmm. course there are people who are very risk tolerant and people who don't like risk at all. But then I think sometimes if you're on the other end where you don't like risk at all, you do end up missing out on what could have been in that makes sense. So it's always good to try rolling the dice every once in a while and see, see where it takes you. It's funny. Cause I think when I, when we first met, you said you're pretty risk averse though. Right. At um, least in, in your entrepreneur journey, right. Which, which is already a step towards being unrisky. So. Yeah, yeah. I would just like, like I, in entrepreneurship, I would say I'm very risky, but in other things, I don't like risk at all. So it, it's like, it's weird. It's an exam. This you don't mind me. <laughs> um, like, I guess, I guess like a stupid example would be like, I go to the same restaurants and I always order the same food 
no matter what. And I could order the same thing for the next five years and still be fine. So I, I like routine. I like familiarity in that part of my life, but in the business side of my life, I, I take risks, right? I, I gamble. So, um, gamble in business. Um, mm. so, you know, like, uh, you know, in for, for some people, there are risks like spectrums in, in every single like state, uh, every single part of life. If that makes sense. Yeah. I guess it's the, uh, like a metaphorical, uh, what is it that Steve Jobs wore? Like a black turtleneck, you know, mm. like a metaphorical black turtleneck for you. Like, y y yeah, because like you you make all these risky decisions all day. The last thing you want to do is like pick a risky shirt to wear that that morning, <laughs> right? I guess I don't know. You know what I mean? So it's totally understandable. Man. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Like Mark Zuckerberg does that too. The the, the his shirt. Man, a lot of those tech thing. guys they all they all do that. So interesting. Yeah, there's like uh, I think I lived in in the Silicon Valley, if you want to call it that, for a while, and and it's funny like. You'll see some people, a lot of people just like cop you that, that, you know, just wear a black shirt type of thing or, you know, something like that. So, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, do, do they have businesses too, or are they just trying to like launch doing that same? Oh, everybody has a startup. Everybody has a startup. Like, even if it's not a real business, like they have startups, like it's weird. Silicon Valley is a weird place. And, and I actually left, um. You know, I, I, I wasn't, I was there just for grad school in engineering. Um, and I was like, well, I don't really see myself like, first of all, like starting a business in California, there's just a mi million extra hmm. problems, right? Like, uh, I don't, I guess I probably don't have to extrapolate on that because, um, you know, like uh, Elon Musk left and all the Joe Rogan left and all this stuff, but, but, um, it's still possible though, right? You just need to, yeah. you just need to know how to work taxes and stuff, but, um. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting place. I don't know. Everyone's obviously super tech oriented. I feel like a lot of people just follow the, what everybody else does, sort of the, you know, right now AI is the thing. So everybody's going to start an AI uh, startup and stuff. But, but, um, I don't know the whole, I think we talked about this also when we first met, like one thing I don't like about the business model of a startup, the tech startup is first of all, there's big front up front end uh expenses like software engineers you know as a whole are expensive to hire and um you know they expect ridiculous salaries and all this stuff right but um <laughs> but uh but you know i mean there's a reason there that that's the you know the market sets certain certain um you know sets, sets their salaries but um but yeah other than you know you have to hire all these expensive software engineers and they're not really cash flowing businesses. It's trending more towards that. I think people are like realizing that they need to do like more like a actually cash flowing business. But, um, but yeah, like the basic model is like some, like, you know, you go to a VC, gives you money. He's, he's invested in a bunch of different, um, uh, startups and maybe one of them works, you know, he's on it. Sometimes I just think they're throwing cash out the way. So yeah, out the window, you know, which is, I don't know, I, I'm not like some expert, but you know, I, I guess it must be profitable, although it doesn't seem like it to me, but, uh, but yeah, so then, you know, the one that hits makes them, all, you know, a considerable amount of money, which must be recompense for it. But, but, you know, as a s startup founder or whatever, like there is no cash flow. You're just creating a bunch of value that you then sell to like Facebook and right now, Facebook, Google, all these companies aren't buying as much as they used to, you know, they're reducing after all the, um, after all the layoffs last year, the year before, or whatever, like after COVID, um, uh, you know, like Elon Musk with Twitter firing like the majority of the company mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But, but those are big companies and, and like, they're just not buying as much. And I don't know, I, I sort of saw the decline of that model as I was there living. Um, so then I was like, you know what, I'm gonna get out of here. And, um, and then I sort of found e-commerce and that's sort of where I'm starting on now. And part of it is podcast, but I am. Yeah. So I would say software it is if you go to software, you have to really, really love software. Mm -hmm. Um, just because you are going to be competing against the world, uh, for that software, like, like 
lots of people in India, uh, the Philippines, the United States that also love software and mm. that are very, very intelligent. So you have to be intelligent and you have to love uh, software. Uh, for e-commerce, it's less competitive just because let's say I'm selling to the U.S. Uh, people who are out of the country, it is a little bit harder to sell in the U.S. or other countries, right? So you do have the mode of geography and also you have the mode of product, right? Where product, where the fact that you have to ship a product um, adds that extra expense versus software. The advantage, of course, is that as soon as you have a good product, you can scale to the moon because you don't have to deal with distribution. Uh, but the disadvantage is that other people can compete with you very, very easily, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting because the trend I think before was, okay, let's find a technical co-founder. And that's where all these people are going to cop sci degrees, stuff like that. But now it seems like the most important asset is a marketing co-founder, mm -hmm. somebody who knows how to distribute, you know, whether it's software, physical products at scale mm -hmm. using. XYZ method, like it has ads or influencers or whatever. Hmm. Interesting. So it's like, it's like software became a lot more commoditized, uh, probably because of AI making it easier to code or no code, no code tools, right? But, but there's a lot of no code thing. tools out there. So at this point, it's like, okay, you don't really need to be technical because you have all these tools out there. You just need to know how to distribute your, your product. Yeah. Cause I think you hear of like more non-technical founders of software companies I've, or I've been hearing more and more about them. So it's, it's seeming like it's becoming less important to actually know, to have some technical background that at the same time, it's like, if you want to create a valuable product, I feel like you need to know the ins and outs of your product no, and how sure. can you, if you're, if you're just purely, you know, a salesperson and which is important, but like, you know, if you don't know your product. It seems questionable to me, but, um, yeah, but, yeah and I would, so. I would just say it's the, it's the trend. Of course, with any trend, like there is, um, like, like a spectrum of what you need to know, what you don't need to know. Right. And you don't want to chase trends, right? Which is something I noticed in Silicon Valley and like everyone chases trends, but, oh yeah. but, and the, but I, I have to admit though, the nice thing about a software company is there's no physical product. So. You don't need to find a manufacturer, you know, you don't need to ship it. You don't, you know, there's not all those like, which is like you said, it's much easier and you can hire like these logistics companies that do it all for you. But, but you know, with a software company, you might can be in Panama right now, which, you know, you can to a degree do that with a, with a physical product. But, um, cause I, I suppose you do everything basically remote, but, um. But yeah, I guess there's just more liberty, I'd say, right? Like, and, and there's less of a headache and you don't need to do lab testing and like you did pre, you know what I mean? So there's benefits, right? Yeah. yeah. And I, I, don't, I don't know much about software, so I can't really speak to it, but for e-commerce, the, the physical aspect and also like, let's say for sunscreen, you have to do a lot of testing. It is hard for beginners, but as you progress in the business career, like it becomes an advantage, right? Where there is a mode. It is harder for people to get in. So that means you can continue to sell without much competition. The, the, your expertise becomes the mode or what? Or like, the um, like let's say for sunscreen and testing, that the testing as a cost has mm -hmm. become a mode for our business because all those people selling tallow sunscreens, they're doing it illegally. So that means they can't scale, right? Mm -hmm. So then they have to remain small until they start doing the testing themselves. And you can sort of create like a loyal fan base, you know what I mean? Like there, I've had the experience and sometimes I stop myself because I don't want to fall for, for like advertising and stuff. Right. But, but like I've had moments where like, no, I'm just going to go with the, you know, basically the most famous brand and cause I know it works and you know, it'll get the job done. Um, and so you see some other brands trying to come up and they don't exist cause they're, you're battling like a. Not a giant, it's not a monopoly, but it's like, you know, an established band brand that, that, um, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, well, we met uh, you, I think you went to the capitalism conference, uh, this year, didn't you? Right. Um, we didn't actually meet there, but we met after, <laughs> but, but, um, what's it called? Uh, this guy, the mushroom coffee, mm -hmm. uh, he lives in Austin. I forget his name. Um, uh, four sigmatic. I forget his, uh, I forget oh, yes. his name. Um, it's, he's like from Scandinavia. Yeah, right? he's from Finland. Um, okay, he's yeah. from Finland. 
but, and he lives in Austin, but, um, I'll put it well, in the show notes or whatever, but, um, but yeah, for Sigmatic, like if you see, like when it first came out, it was the only thing in the market. Right? And then now it's still the most famous, you know, mushroom coffee. Right. And like, I don't know, I don't like, there's a bunch of other coffee mushroom brand stuff, but you know, the three times a year that I buy some mushroom coffee, I would just get four Sigmatic because it's the first one I knew of and, and the one I've had, you know, used for years or whatever. So, and this is not like a paid ad or anything. <laughs> just <laughs> like, it's just, uh, it's just, yeah, I've tried it. Zoom. Yeah. What I have found interesting as a side note is when you have a physical product, it's very, and th that you actually like, it is nice mm -hmm. seeing it in the real world versus like, mm -hmm. let's say software, you know, always exists on the cloud, something that's a little bit more intangible, but for like the sunscreen, I was sharing it with my family, showing it to my friends, asking them for feedback. So it's a very like person to person experience mm -hmm. there, right? Where you can like share it with them. What, what type of engineer are you? Like what the branch? I was, uh, doing mechanical engineering uh, okay. before I dropped out, of course, but yeah. I worked at a lab before, um, in high school. So mm -hmm. I actually ended up publishing a science paper on that. So we were basically the, the paper is, I was trying on to what? make like a science paper. No, no, but on what, like, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, what was the topic? Yeah. So the, the problem we were trying to solve is Flint, Michigan and their lead based mm -hmm. water. So we were coming up with a organic filter for that. So that required a lot of chemistry and that's where I learned how to, you know, um, that's where I learned the basis of what I'm actually applying to the sunscreen today. Yeah. It's, it's funny. I'm a structural engineers. It's, it's like a type of civil engineering, mm -hmm. designing buildings and such, and similar to mechanical, I guess. Um, but, uh, yeah, like I've always leaned, leaned, is that the word? Leaned towards, uh, um, like physical items. Like, I don't know, yeah. like, I, you know, I, uh, I became a structural engineer because I saw buildings, something physical and I'll, okay, it is. seems nice. I, I want to say that I did that. Right. Which as I was, as opposed to like software, which I got much more into it in grad school, like, um, took a lot of computer science classes and stuff, but, um, just being in Silicon Valley and stuff. But, uh, but yeah, I, I still never had that like love for it. Right. Because it was like, okay, like I want something tangible. So totally. I don't know. That was just my experience. So that's why I was curious, like what's up engineering you were, cause mechanical lends itself to to what I'm talking about. So, oh yeah. Yeah. For yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. some people gravitate towards software and that's totally fine. Like you can make so much money with software. The multiples are crazy. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it, that's, that's really nice if you end up exiting. Then some people gravitate towards physical products and e-commerce is perfect for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, um, well, man, it's been great chatting. Uh, don't want to go too far past the hour, but, um, yeah, maybe we could do this again when you, when you have more of an update on, on your, on your sunscreen brand, hopefully, you know, hopefully it goes well and all, yeah. you know, uh, hopefully a good well, update. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're going to be working on it for five, 10 years, right? So. <laughs> So you'll, you'll, we'll, we'll definitely have time to, to do another one of these, but, um, but yeah, man, I, I appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with me and, uh, and, uh, yeah, I'll stay in touch and, and all. And, uh, thanks, man. Awesome. Yeah, it was fun. For sure.